conjunction with other people. In fact, it was so much so, and this is from Mark Katz's book, you would think it odd, would you not? You would endeavor to dissemble your surprise. You would look twice to see whether some other person were not hidden in some corner of the room, basically talking about somebody's listening to music by themselves. And if you, you found no such one, would painfully blush as if you had discovered your friend sniffing cocaine, emptying a bottle of whiskey, or plating straws in his hair. People, we think, should not do such things to themselves, however much they may enjoy doing them in company. There's, there's a lot to unpack in that sense. They may not even talk to themselves without, uh, without incurring grave suspicion, and I fear that if I, were, uh, if I were discovered listening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony without a, a chaperone to guarantee my sanity, my friends would uh, fall away with grievous shaking of the head. Uh, 1923, I mean, and it seems overblown, you know, but this was the understanding that we, coming from a society where we made music together, that when we made the shift into listening to music, we listened to music together. I think we all would all agree that we are moved away from that quite a bit. Um, so, again, um, making music, listening to music, listening to music alone, here's some other things that I, uh, looking at the time, really would love to talk about, maybe question and answer, I'll have a little bit more time. Uh, when I teach my class, I talk about the distinctions between deep listening and shallow listening, borrowing the idea, if you remember, uh, Nicholas Carr's Atlantic article, Is Google Making Us Stupid? Uh, and then his book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, and how he, he laments the loss of deep reading. I extrapolate from that and say we, we're losing some of the capacity to do deep listening. And what does that mean for us? The shift from what I would call listening through to listening stew, uh, the idea that you, know, you listen to things on shuffle. Uh, if it doesn't catch your attention in 15 seconds, you move on. Uh, and so the idea that somebody could listen to all of Brahms' second piano concerto in one sitting, uh, for many of, our, um, many of our people, our peers, as well as our students, is becoming more and more an, an anomaly. And then uh, switching uh, between the sanctuary and the stadium, I have a lot to talk about. Sanctuary mentality, sanctuary behaviors versus stadium mentality and stadium, stadium behaviors. Both are important, but mu much of what life has been about has been a loss of, of sanctuary types of behaviors in uh, exchange for st uh, stadium-like behaviors. I think I got that right. Um, so I'll, if there's time, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Easy listening and developmental space. So what do we do to monitor our listening habits and the listening habits of those around us? Um, when I talk to my students about uh, growing up, you know, you know internet uh, time was monitored, uh, how much time they spent playing video games, how much time they watched the television, all these things were monitored, but their parents, by and large, gave them their iPods and said, go. And it's a kind of an interesting idea that what music is harmless, but if we read uh, Campbell and, you know, Doman, you know, the idea of music can have all these wonderful knockoff effects for us, I think you know, while they don't explore it as much as I would like, they should also talk about music can also be deleterious, used in certain kind of ways, beyond the kind of Suzanne Cusick torture kinds of things, just this constant uh, exposure to music also may not have as beneficial uh, effects as some people naively imagine. Um, to go back and see how the music we listen to affects us, I'm sure you've all been in the situations, of circumstances, where you've left a restaurant and your companions start singing a song and they have no idea why that is the case. Uh, and then when you tell them it was the last song playing on the, uh, in the restaurant, they are horrified that they weren't even aware that that was going on. They were so immune to that. Uh, and so there are these ways that music is affecting us without our cognizant uh, attention to these things. Uh, and you know, to what degree, this is the last thing, do we treat music as seriously as we treat other stimuli, as you know, the idea of secondhand smoke uh, we take seriously, uh, but secondhand sound, the idea that we want to preserve how much stimulation comes into lives uh, through other mediated means, but where does music fit into these? These are developmental issues, not merely for kids who are uh, younger, but also for ourselves as well. 
In my class, we have what I call a week without music. The kids call it that too, because that's what I call it. Um, and we set up the guidelines for the week without music, and they all are terrified when they see it ha happens in week four. And basically what the week without music means, no iPods and no YouTube. Um, if they want to go, if they're involved in the band or orchestra or choir, they're allowed to do that. If they're preparing for a recital or performance, they're allowed to practice. Uh, but the idea, uh, we try and get them to stay away from uh, you know, making casual music in the dorm uh, and uh, trying to avoid music, spaces where music occurs. And particularly, uh, removing the music of which they have control uh, out of their lives for one week. And they keep a log, uh, eight entries, one at the very beginning of the week without music, one every day in the week without music. Um, and my experience is that students who are deliberate about their musical choices, that they are practicing or they are singing, uh, have very little difficulty with doing a week without YouTube and iPods. But for my students for whom the easy listening is part and parcel of how they live their lives, they struggle. They struggle mildly. Um, by a week without music. Here's some quotes from one journal. Normally I wake up and naturally open my computer and play music in my iTunes to start my day off. However, I clicked on a song to play, but I didn't hear music being played because I turned my volume off for the week. In other words, it was an automatic response that he had uh, checked himself on. Another student in another iteration of this talked about how he went uh, 90 minutes going through all these YouTube videos before he realized that he was in the middle of a week without music. <laughs> I feel more tired than normal. My sleep schedule has been very normal and regular, but I feel like I'm somewhat living in black and white. I'm assuming it is the lack of music that I am experiencing. This is a regular comment I hear from students. One, one who said she felt, felt flat, she didn't feel herself, uh, she didn't feel that she could socialize as well. And when I remarked to her, that said, the way you're describing music sounds a lot like people, the way people describe alcohol. In other words, that music lubricates your life in certain kind of ways, and without it now, you are struggling. And when I mentioned that to her, she just basically uh, was incredulous. How could I say such a thing? And I'm saying, you're the one reporting your behavior to me. I'm just asking you to reflect on it. To some extent, I agree that music can be an addiction because it really is difficult to live without after experiencing it and having certain relationships with it. And you know, here are students again who are so used to having music in their lives when you say, uh, not right now, uh, they don't know what to do. One of the things that also happens when we go through this week without music, uh, I use the two words that I use a lot in my classroom, they begin to understand when I talk about the invisibility and the ubiquity of music. That they had no idea that there is as much music out there as there is, and that very little of it can they control? And for some of them, it really kind of scares them uh, that they are constantly exposed in these kind of ways. Uh, let's see what this student said. Being able to hear music in the frat basements last night was comparable to a drug addict getting their hands on drugs again. I didn't think I was addicted to music, but by my sixth day without music, I was beginning to go a little crazy, and I was shocked about how happy I instantly became when I walked into a frat and heard Chicken Fried by Zach Brown Band playing. You know, I, yeah, I'm not shocked. You know, it makes perfect sense. Music makes us happy. Why wouldn't she be happy? But the level of, you know, that she was so accustomed to these kind of inputs taken away, again, she was feeling tired or something like that, and now uh, she's electrified. In fact, she said it's like loud music and it's a catalyst for rowdy college behavior. And I wanted to write, do you think? <laughs> And you, and you stop and think about these things going in tandem. Not, not that if everybody started playing string quartets in, in frat basements, everything would be better, uh, but there does seem to be, uh, well, I'll let the real scientists work on the correlation versus causation kind of issues here. Now, these kind of things where music affects us in certain kind of ways, very often we find it a humorous kind of way. So we read these things that this woman is so happy, we laugh about it. Uh, here is a video that uh, didn't quite go viral. I'm somewhat surprised that it didn't, uh, because when you know, and you'll hear the laughter, uh, and when most people watch it, uh, they find it humorous. No. So, again, 
Um, I'll come back to that. You know, things that we sometimes find humorous aren't always funny. So here's another video, not about music. So you get the, you know, those kind of things. You know, those, some of us are old enough to remember when the DDT trucks went through our neighborhoods to, um, you know, because polio was uh, so prevalent. I don't know about some of you, but I vividly, I'm old enough to remember that and running behind the DDT truck, uh, enjoying the smell of Black Flag or whatever that was. Um, and, you know, they did it to us in one sense. I mean, we, you know, I have a video of uh, the, vid uh, the trucks going through San Antonio, uh, just blasting uh, these sidewalks and horses and things like that. And uh, we look at it now and, and ask ourselves, how in the world did that ever, you know, uh, be allowed to happen? Well, you know, they did that to us. And, and we thought it was in exchange for a greater good. Uh, maybe it was, but let's not, let's not pretend that there was not an ethical component to that where we did not have the choice about what happened uh, and the exposure um, that occurred to us. So now here's a provocative picture. Well, sorry. What are our ethical considerations when personal agency is removed from uh, a person? What kinds of choices can we make on their behalf? And how do we know if the things we are doing benefit them. Here's a provocative picture because many of you will remember this video. Um, if you don't know the video of Henry, a 92-year-old uh, Alzheimer's uh, patient, you can easily find it. Uh, it's called The Power of Music. And what happened to Henry, uh, catatonic for the most part, when he was uh, put, when an iPod and headphones were put onto him playing music that he knew, uh, he seemed to come alive. And uh, when I show my students this, uh, they all get excited, and you know, what music is a wonderful way of, of bringing people in, back into themselves. I talked to Arthur Kaplan, a very famous uh, medical ethicist. Uh, you might know him through the Terry Schiavo case. And we were talking about, well, one of the wonderful things about music is that you can remember the time and place when you heard certain songs. So what happens to Henry when, outside of his agency, uh, he is re brought back to a time and a place that is not the time and is not the place where he is. I'm not suggesting that the therapy is wrong, but I'm asking, are we asking these kind of questions? And how do we make the trade-offs between our choices and what might be good for Henry? Or this baby, when you're looking at him doing this, you know, I don't think we would think it was funny if we uh, filled this baby full of sugar and it was running around, or if I you know, had the needle in and jacked it up with drugs that made him do these same kind of actions. But somehow, with music, we find that amusing. It's the same kind of thing. And I don't see this baby looking as though he is in pleasure doing this. And so we're making this baby do tricks for us so we can laugh about it? I'm not sure, all the more so given that music has a neurological effect on who we are as individuals. So they are, you know, I have no idea how many times they do this to this child, but they are rewiring that child. That's an ethical question that we need to wrestle with. And so I get to neurological space here. Arousal and mood, okay? Short term, but long term. Changes in neurological architecture and function. Music does that. We saw that in our first paper about uh, different places of our brain that uh, are affected when we practice music, even if we listen to music. So what are the ethical considerations we need to take under consideration when we are engaged with music? I'm looking at, I think I have time. Uh, let's go outside of this and look at a video. Maybe you've seen the, the PBS program, I believe it came out in 2010, Digital Nation. Uh, it really has nothing to say about music. In fact, one of the interesting things about it is that the, uh, the documentarians put music in the background at different moments, and I, I, I ask myself, why do they need to have that music? Again, they're trying to manipulate my mood. I understand that, but it's an interesting thing. They talk very little about music, but it, they have this very interesting moment. Let's see if I can, this is my, oh, okay. Okay. That's gonna be bad if I can't get anything here. 
All right, so we'll go here. All right, enter full screen, and I think I should be starting right where I want to. Things and just keeping track of the many things that are going on in our lives. No one's actually measured whether these kids are as successful in multitasking as they claim to be. But out in California, a respected research lab is studying their counterparts on the Stanford campus in Palo Alto. You know, they understand the research, they're smart kids, but they seem utterly convinced it doesn't apply to them. We want to study what's really going on in the brain. MRI studies we're going to be seeing. But when it comes to what parts of the brain they're doing, we know nothing. These are really the first studies of brain imaging of multitaskers versus non-multitaskers. So anything we discover here is new, because we know zero. Now, in this lab here, we're researching speaking on the cell phone while driving. Tell me about a time when you had to deal with a difficult person. You walk around the world, and you see people multitasking. They're playing games, and they're reading email, and they're on Facebook, etc. Yet, classic psychology says that's impossible. No one can do that. In general, our brains can't do two things at once. And we want to ask the question, how do they do it? Do they have some secret ingredient, some special ability that psychologists had no idea about? Or what's going on? You guys were chosen because you're very high chronic multitaskers. Nas allowed us to film one of his studies, conducted on a group of carefully chosen students. On a college campus, most kids are doing things at once, maybe three things at once. These are kids who are doing five, six or more things at once all the time. The experiment looks simple. Identify numbers as odd or even, letters as vowels or consonants. But it's rife with traps in the form of distractions. NASA is testing how quickly these kids can switch between tasks without losing their focus. I'm pretty much constantly texting. And whenever I study, I have my laptop out and listen to Brian YouTube. is a junior. I'm watching a YouTube video, I'm checking my email, nonstop refreshing the page, and on Facebook, Facebook chat. He's pretty confident that his multitasking is successful. So that I can always stay connected. So you think you're effective? I think so. OK. But his results, like others NASA has tested, suggested otherwise. What we found was that you're actually significantly slower when you're switching than when you're doing kind of the same task uh, consistently. <laughs> Virtually all multitaskers think they are brilliant at multitasking. And one of the big discoveries is, you know what, you're really lousy at it. And that's really all I need you to see about that particular video. And I don't know if you uh, heard him say, the, uh, Brian, the student, say that among the things he does when he multitasks is he listens to music. And one of the things that I don't think enough people have talked about as we think about multitasking is music is also one of the tasks that many of our students, many of our peers are involved in when they are multitasking. It seems like we talk about Facebook or email or video or something like that, but music also engages the brain. And so if you're listening to that, that is part of the multitasking aspect. So let's see where I am now. Okay, I'm a little farther up here. Let's see. We'll try this slide. Okay, we're a little farther than that. All right, so well, let's play. All right, so already done that. Just talked a little bit about uh, Mr. Nass and this kind of thing. And my point is to uh, uh, talk about, you know, we have these multitasking devices that have come into our lives in certain kind of ways uh, that uh, have re relatively profoundly uh, affected our, our lives because these really are dopamine delivery devices um, in certain kind of ways. Uh, and you can read um, read uh, in the book there a little bit about them. But I don't think we think about them in that way. We don't think about them contributing to the multitasking and to the brain architecture, to the, the chemical makeup of our bodies, but they do. They do. So I, you know, well, here's another quote from uh, The Week Without Music. I opened iTunes and only remembered not to listen to music as I was pulling my headphones out of my backpack. I do not even really notice that I play music while I study. It is like second nature to me, but now I am aware uh, that was a close call. It feels strange to be studying in silence. I can't believe I just said that I find it weird to be studying in silence. Isn't that how one is supposed to study? I find it more difficult for me to focus. I'm distracted by random things. I feel like having the music playing through my earphones provides background noise that actually allows me to focus better. 
Remember what Nass said about the outcomes of people who multitask. And I think you know, this tension between the dopamine delivery device making you feel like you're doing better and the actual results are worth discussing and bringing up in front of ourselves and other people. Uh, because I think most people think, again, you know, I'll put on music, it'll get me in the right mood to do the work I want. I'm all for that. The arousal in the mood, the, the initial stimulus, great things. After 15 minutes, probably not so great. The brain is occupied and all this other kind of multitasking stuff, and you'd be better off turning the music off. Uh, but we have this impression, no, it's making me focus better, partly because it makes you feel better. So I have a hypothesis. I think this is the slide. A century of ubiquitous music delivered in ever smaller doses and offered delivered invisibly has eroded our ability to concentrate. It's not simply that my student has trouble focusing because it's silence. It's because uh, the ability to concentrate has been compromised uh, by the ways that we have been deploying music in our lives. I could say a lot more about that. I'm looking at the clock. I've got to keep going. So there are parallels, I would argue, to another phenomenon, and this is a rift on Gary Wilson. Some of you will recognize this name right off the bat. Uh, others of you will not. I'm going to play for you a little bit of a TED Talk that Gary Wilson gave. Remember at the very beginning, I talked about the great music experiment that we're conducting as people are engaged in music in these rather profound ways, and there are very few control groups. There is another big experiment happening where there don't seem to be very many control groups, and that is in porn. And he does, his talk is about uh, the great porn experiment that we're watching as young males, mostly, but also adult males, uh, have easy access to internet porn. And he talks about what that does to males. Basically, it makes them less capable of making long-term relationships, uh, less able to uh, 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 sustain an erection, all kinds of interesting things that are completely predictable. Uh, and yet, uh, how do we dial that back? So uh, here's a video a little bit from it. This all those right. hits of dopamine can tell your brain to do two things. First, they say, man, you have hit the evolutionary jackpot. Second, they kick in a molecular switch called delta Fos B. I know it's a fancy word, but dopamine kicks in delta Fos B. And that starts to accumulate in the brain's reward circuit. Now, with excess chronic consumption of drugs or natural rewards, this buildup of delta Fos B starts to alter the brain and promotes a cycle of binging and craving. If the binging continues, the delta Fos B builds up, and it can lead to brain changes seen in all <coughs> addicts. So the dominoes are excess con consumption, Excess dopamine, delta Fos B, brain changes. 